we know the folks in control? <laughs> if we don't, nobody does, right? I'm fine, how are you? Will oh, you cross out 40 and run 50 at 50? Well, I just yes. wanted to make yes. I just In the last hour, <laughs> it has increased by 10 years. You could always lower your seat. So you've done a fair amount of testing You've done a fair amount of testimony. So like if you want it. Right. No? More, more of a recent thing? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I could yeah. sort of relax a little bit. Uh, yeah. So, um, the, the guy, well, the guy was the yeah. uh, initial counsel was just realized that you're only playing with that. You don't allow this to score any points. Correct. <laughs> There's a lot of folks outside too. Oh, there you are. I'm going to do that for sure. Matt's refusing to take my phone. All right, for 
good. Yeah, we're good. Really? I wonder what this guy says. <laughs> well, we're getting ready to start. <laughs> yeah, well, don't worry, they will. Yeah. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. Subcommittee will uh, subcommittee will now come to order. I'd like to thank everyone for uh, for being here today. Uh, let me start off by saying how uh, uh, Rick and I and the subcommittee are, our thoughts and prayers are with the families of the uh, missing Malaysian Airlines flight. Um, I know we're all anxiously awaiting to hear what happened there. And at this point, all we can say is our thoughts and prayers are, are with them. Um, again, let me begin by thanking everyone for, uh, for being here today and everyone that helped organize this hearing. Uh, the FAA has been a great host, um, and I really appreciate all of their efforts to accommodate us. I also want to thank the ranking member, uh, Rick Larson, from the state of Washington for taking time out of his day to see firsthand. We had a tour this morning. Um, I think it was your first time here, Rick, yep. and got a good opportunity to see uh, why we, th we are the premier facility in the entire United States of America, in fact, the world, for safety and security and research and development. Uh, our laboratories are one of a kind, uh, but as great as the laboratories are, it's the men and women who work here at the Tech Center who make all of this go. The dedication, the enthusiasm, the commitment to excellence uh, is deeply appreciated, and we want to personally acknowledge you for that. Um, I want to wel also welcome our witnesses today. Uh, we look forward to your testimony. Um, I've been very fortunate to represent the Tech Center during my time in Congress. And while I have not always been chairman of the Aviation Committee, um, I've always been uh, the biggest cheerleader and a huge supporter for the work that's done here. Uh, and I believe that uh, the work that goes on here uh, will make such a tremendous difference to our aviation system in the country. Um, one example of this is the uh, work that was done here at the Tech Center uh, on the Asiana cr crash, which was last July, July of 2013. And while the loss of any life is tragic, um, I have been, uh, it could have been much worse if the improvements and the safety developments that had been worked on here uh, were not implemented into that flight. Uh, the Tech Center houses the world's largest um, aviation test facility. Uh, work here has produced uh, safety improvements, including, uh, again, the most recent aviation um, slides that fuel tank explosion protection, fire blocking layers, and seat cushions. Uh, these efforts reduce the likelihood of a fire on board an aircraft and should one occur, slow the spread of fire, giving passengers more time to activate, uh, evacuate an aircraft and ultimately save lives. And while I could go on for quite a while talking about the wide range of important work that goes on here, today's hearing is focused on the Tech Center's role in the development and implementation of the FAA's air traffic control modernization, modernization program known as Next, Next Gen. Uh, the goal is to ensure the Tech Center's resources and expertise are being used in a way that makes the most sense. The Tech Center serves as the core FAA research and development facility for NextGen. And looking back, the Tech Center has been involved in some of the earliest air traffic control projects, including the design and development of early air traffic control automation systems and the first air traffic control tower cab mock-up to validate controller work areas. These projects served as a foundation for our existing system. And today, the Tech Center continues to play an integral role in the development, testing, and validation of the latest and greatest technologies. This includes, includes programs such as satellite navigation, text message-like data communications, and the enabling software to process next-gen technologies and capabilities. These programs are essential to NextGen, and the testing and validation work that's being done right here at this facility is unmatched anywhere. Further, the Tech Center's role isn't uh, over once the new system is deployed in the field. For example, when an en route 
automation modernization called ERAM, software experience site-specific problems as it was being installed in FAA facilities. The problems were relayed to the tech center. Here, government and industry teams were able to troubleshoot the problem in a simulated environment, develop a solution, and transmit the solution back to air traffic facility for implementation. The ability to conduct that type of work is only possible because of the integrated laboratories here at the Tech Center. One of the key laboratories is the next-gen integration and evaluation capability. Among its many functions, it has the ability to provide a combined environment of legacy systems with future technologies and capabilities, enabling it to support the transition to NextGen. Given the considerable challenges with the ongoing transition to NextGen, we must examine every available resource here at the Tech Center and ensure they are being adequately utilized, especially the world-class expertise of the Tech Center employees. Finally, as part of the transition to NextGen, the FAA, in partnership with industry stakeholders, must also safely integrate unmanned aircraft systems, or UAS, into the national airspace system. The Tech Center currently leads the FAA's surf safety research and development program. Though this program, through this program, the Tech Center continually works with the FAA's regulatory organization to increase safety and allow for new technologies and ideas, including UAS. And as the committee saw earlier in the tour of the NIAC laboratories, the Tech Center has already flown UAS using simulation in the national airspace system. The FAA Tech Center will have a key role in helping collect, protect, and analyze, integrate, and validate operational and safety data that will become available from the six UAS test ranges established by the FAA. This data, along with the other work, is essential for the FAA to develop the regulatory program to allow for the safe UAS operations in the national airspace system. We need to make sure that the Tech Center has what it needs for that, for that important work. Um, I want to just take a moment to say also, that we are all pretty proud here in New Jersey and of the Tech Center for being named one of the six national test sites. Uh, there was sort of a nationwide RFP that was put out. Um, this was a recognition that the technology is tremendous with UAS systems. The application for everyday and quality of life issues is enormous, but the ability to safely integrate them into our airspace with a with the proper privacy uh, restraints that are put on there is something that we look forward to. And being one of only six in the entire United States of America where the New Jersey uh, application along with Virginia has made it to that final stage is something that we can all be pretty proud of and I think holds a great opportunity. Um, with that, I'd like to quickly introduce today's witnesses. Our first panel, we have the Honorable Michael Whitaker, the FAA's Deputy Administrator and Chief Next Gen Officer, and Mr. Dennis Filler, Director of the Tech Center and the Head of Research and Development. Uh, on our second panel, we have Mr. Pete Dumont, uh, President and CEO of the Air Traffic Control Association and Co-Chair of the Next Gen Institute Management Council. Mrs. Ms. Cynthia Castillo, President and CEO of CSSI Incorporated, Melvin Davis, a National Representative for the Next Gen National Air Traffic Controllers Association, and uh, Mr. Ben Gilo, General Counsel and Senior Government Relations Manager for the Association of Unmanned Systems International. On behalf of the subcommittee, we welcome you. We thank you in advance for your testimony. We certainly look forward to hearing from each of you and your perspectives on the Tech Center and NextGen and UAS-related resources, as well as your vision for what the Tech Center's role might look like into the years ahead. Uh, I now ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials for the record. Uh, without objection, that is so ordered. And now I'd like to turn to uh, Ranking Member, Mr. Rick Larson. And Rick, thanks again for being here today. Thanks, Frank. I uh, appreciate it. I want to thank Chairman Loviano for calling today's uh, hearing to discuss modernizing the aviation system, leveraging the assets of the FAA's William J. Hughes Technical Center. It was a pleasure to be here today and to tour this world-class uh, facility and meet some world-class people involved in the research. Over the past year uh, that uh, Frank and I have uh, led the subcommittee, I've learned a lot through the hearings and through the listening sessions. 
Uh, Frank's done a great job of organizing the work of the subcommittee to be sure that we are, um, that the subcommittee itself is on the cutting edge of trying to figure out where the FAA and where the uh, national airspace and where the aviation system and industry needs to go. I really appreciate his leadership. Getting to see some of this new technology today has helped me better understand the rapidly evolving landscape for our aviation industry. And for those who don't know my district, if you fly in an airplane that ends with a seven, it's probably built in my district. Um, that give you a flavor of uh, where I come from. It's about 200 aerospace, other aerospace suppliers in my district. And in Washington State, there's over 1,000 other aerospace suppliers, um, all operating and, and working not just because of an, uh, uh, an active aviation industry worldwide, but because of a lot of the foundational work that takes place in uh, research and development here at the Tech Center. So our time here today highlights the ongoing need for a well-trained workforce that understands the complexities of our air system. And the center is a unique place for uh, innovation to advance aviation technology. Um, everything from uh, hardware and software that you need to find out, what, to, to get information out to people uh, so they understand what the weather is going to be like sooner, to the guys over in the fire system who get to blow things up, uh, which is pretty cool uh, as well. <laughs> Um, for over 50 years, the uh, Technical Center has served as the primary FAA research and development facility to enhance aviation safety and modernize the nation's air traffic control system. And most recently, the Tech Center has been a cornerstone for the FAA in research and development of major next-gen programs uh, like um, automatic dependent surveillance broadcast and data communications, both of which we saw this morning. While the implementation of next-gen has uh, been long, and challenging, the FAA has made progress in part because of the ongoing work here at the center. The next big challenge facing the FAA is ensuring the safe integration of unmanned aircraft systems, or UAS, into one of the most complex air traffic systems in the world. And the M FAA Modernization and Reform Act of 2012 set forth requirements and milestones for the FAA to integrate UAS into the national airspace. And one of the act's provisions required the FAA to select six test ranges. These sites are located throughout the country and will begin soon collecting safety and operational data. Test site data will assist the agency in developing policies for future commercial and civil use of unmanned aircraft. And so today, as part of the hearing, I certainly want to hear how the FAA intends to work with test sites to ensure that it's able to collect, protect, and share the data that it needs. I'm also interested to hear how the agency will ensure privacy near the test sites. Unfortunately, the Tech Center can provide the FAA with the asset assets to collect, validate, and analyze all the data it intends to gather. So I hope to hear more about the, uh, how the FAA intends to use its resources here as well to help advance the integration of UAS and to advance next generation air traffic control. So I want to thank uh, Chairman Lobiondo again for uh, having me uh, up here and, and, uh, and uh, having me as a partner on the committee. I really appreciate it very much. And, uh, Look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rick, very much. And now I'd like to recognize our first witness of the day, FAA Deputy Administrator and Chief Next Gen Officer, Mr. Michael Whitaker. Michael, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Lombiondo, Ranking Member Larson, uh, members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, before we begin, I would also like to take a moment on behalf of the agency to say that our hearts go out to the families of those on Malaysian Air Flight 370. On Saturday, the FAA sent representatives as part of the NTSB investigative team supporting the Malaysian government with the accident investigation. The United States government is in communication across agencies and with international officials to provide any additional assistance that may be necessary. Turning to the matter at hand, to the Tech Center, uh, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to highlight this facility's vital role in deploying NextGen and in integrating unmanned aircraft into our nation's airspace. Let me start by noting that we are nearly complete with the foundation of NextGen. This foundation includes a much needed upgrade of the automation in our air traffic control facilities and building of ground stations to enable the transition from a radar-based to a satellite-based system. Right now, 18 of our 20 en route centers have started running ERAM to control ta traffic in high altitude airspace. More than half are using it exclusively to control air traffic instead of the legacy system from the 1960s. 
All 20 en route centers are expected to be running ERAM exclusively by March of next year, which will allow us to pull down the legacy host system. We're also upgrading the computer system that runs the lower altitude airspace closer to airports. This project, TAMR, requires switching out computer processors, screens, and software in more than 150 TRACON facilities across the country. And throughout the United States, we have installed more than 95% of the ground stations for ADSB, and we will complete the baseline installation this month. With this technology, we'll achieve more precise surveillance of aircraft, which will make the air traffic system safer and more efficient. In addition to this foundation, we continue to implement performance-based navigation procedures. PBN allows aircraft to fly on more direct paths across the country and in congested airspace. These advanced navigation procedures are cutting flight time and reducing fuel burn and emissions. This is all good progress, but it's just the beginning. Completing NextGen's foundation will enable new capabilities that will make aviation safer, more efficient, and more environmentally friendly. NextGen technologies are also making it possible to safely introduce unmanned aircraft into the airspace system. And let me give you a few examples of the connection between NextGen and unmanned aircraft systems. In order for many unmanned aircraft to operate safely in shared airspace, we must develop technologies that enable them to detect and avoid other airborne vehicles. The agency is researching and developing a, a collision avoidance system specifically designed for unmanned aircraft. It's a technology called ACAS-XU. The tech center will also be aiding this effort by conducting flight testing as we saw this morning. Also, ADSB can help achieve collision avoidance through more precise surveillance and separation of both manned and unmanned aircraft in the same vicinity. Another next-gen technology that will support unmanned aircraft is NAS voice system. NVS modernizes the voice communication capabilities that we use for air traffic services. It will enable controllers to communicate with the ground pilot of an unmanned vehicle, even if that pilot is located on the other side of the country. With its world-class laboratories and engineering expertise, the FAA's tech center plays a central role both in the deployment of NextGen and in the safe introduction of unmanned aircraft. As you mentioned, this past December, we announced the selection of six test sites for unmanned aircraft across the country. These test sites, which include state governments and public universities, will provide data to help us determine the safety certification and navigation requirements for unmanned systems. We expect that a significant portion of the test site data collection and analysis will take place at the Technical Center. Later this year, we'll also be conducting simulation modeling for the Department of Defense to assist them in standardizing procedures for unmanned aircraft across various branches of the military. The FAA is working with other government agencies, including NASA and the Department of Homeland Security, on unmanned aircraft projects. By working with other agencies here at the Tech Center, we're able to leverage each other's expertise and resources and minimize the duplication of efforts. Let me close by saying that NextGen is already delivering benefits across the country. We've made great progress toward completing the foundation of NextGen, and we're well positioned to reap more benefits in air traffic efficiency, reduced delays, fuel savings, and environmental improvements. The Tech Center is enabling us to realize these benefits and enabling us to safely introduce unmanned aircraft. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my remarks, and I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Whitaker. Uh, now I'd like to recognize the Head of Research and Development for the FAA and the Director of the Tech Center, Dennis Feller. Dennis, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Chairman Lobiondo and Ranking Member Larson. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify before you today. As the Director of the FAA, William J. Hughes Technical Center, please let me extend a warm welcome to you. It's certainly an honor to have you here with us. The Technical Center is the nation's premier air transportation systems laboratory. We support the development of scientific solutions to both current and future air transportation system challenges. We utilize our one-of-a-kind, world-class laboratory in its environments to enable the modernization and sustainment of the national airspace system. There is no facility like this anywhere in the world. 
replicating the entire national airspace under one roof with the capability to support all aviation systems throughout their complete life cycle. The center's areas of focus include safety, air traffic management, communications, navigation, surveillance, aeronautical information, weather, human factors, flight test, information system security, and airport technologies. The center also provides 24 by 7 operational support to FAA field facilities across the nation. Center specialists diagnose and correct problems so that critical systems can remain operational. Our efforts have an impact felt across the world. As the Deputy Administrator stated, the center plays a central role in both the deployment of NextGen and in the safe integration of unmanned aviation systems into our nation's airspace. Key next-gen foundational programs such as ADSB, ERAM, Datacom have all been developed, tested, or began their nationwide deployment from the technical center through our unique engineering, our test and evaluation, and sustainment activities. You've had the chance to see some of these technologies in action this morning. The center will continue to, to be a key player on un, in unmanned aircraft systems, supporting concept exploration, research and development, and ultimately full integration and in systems testing. The center replicates the entire NAS by having all the equipment and the support systems that exist in the NAS. In addition, we have the ability to simulate or emulate any geographic location or set of operating conditions. As a result, it uniquely positions us to be able to support exploration of unmanned aircraft systems integration. Key next-gen technologies developed right here will enable the safe integration of unmanned aircraft systems into our national airspace system. These systems and other transformational programs have the potential to provide UAS as well as manned aircraft more information, flexibility, situational awareness, and a greater ability to communicate vital information between all users of the national airspace system. Beyond next-gen and unmanned aircraft systems, other critical system safety systems are developed here, including our flame-resistant aircraft seats and interior panels, which you saw this morning, and improved floor and exit lightings, and the standards to which all these products are, are designed and built. The implementation of these standards have permitted the passengers of Asiana Airlines Flight 214 the critical time that they needed to safely exit their aircraft. Thanks in large part to the contributions of Tech Center Research, almost everyone survived that crash. In addition, we've developed and fielded a crushable concrete arresting system that provides a way to quickly and safely stop an aircraft as large as a 747 in the event the plane runs off the end of the runway. Also, we're currently involved in safety research to make it safer to transport lithium batteries. Tech Center also serves as home base for other aviation-related entities. It's the home of the Federal Air Marshal Service Training Program and the Department of Homeland Security's Transportation Security Laboratory. Also located here are a U.S. Coast Guard Aviation Detachment and the New Jersey Air National Guard, as well as the Atlantic City International Airport. These aviation-related entities help create a collaborative, aviation-centered campus that provides a real-world operational environment in which to explore future aviation concepts. Mr. Chairman, once again, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. This time, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll start, um, Mr. Whitaker, with you. Um, with unmanned aerial systems, um, we know that uh, the tech center is going to be very involved. Can you tell us briefly um, how the tech center will um, be involved with the safe integration into the national air space system? And what role will the tech center have with the six new congressionally mandated UAS test ranges? The tech center has been involved to this point and I think will continue to be involved as really the hub of the research that's going on around UASs. So the tech center was involved in administrating the process around selecting the test sites, working with the test sites uh, on contracting, 
and will serve as, a, as a, the hub for, for analyzing data that comes from the research that comes out of the tech sites. Um, there are a number of technologies that we need to understand, sense and avoid being one of the key ones. Uh, communications are also a key element since the pilot is not with the aircraft in this situation. Um, all of those systems will also be tested here and, and, and integrated here. So I would, I would view the test center as really the hub for the effort to integrate, the technical effort to integrate the UAS into the system. Sure. Um, Mr. Filler, what would you say would be the, um, say the top five, five priorities for the tech center in 2014? Mm. Top three. Okay, sir. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> Cut a break here. We don't get the questions in advance. So. No, we don't. Uh, first off is sustain the NAS. We've got to keep the system operating safely, uh, which the center does very routinely. Um, second uh, is development of human capital. Um, we have efforts underway to, to big, bring in um, co-op students and continue to, to develop our workforce. Um, we, like a lot of government, have an aging workforce, and um, we're putting a lot of effort into making sure that we can sustain the, the quality work that we do here each and every day. Um, third area, um, obviously, is integration of UAS into the national airspace system. Understanding where this program is going, how we can contribute, making sure that we have all the resources and the capability to go there. Um, Last area right now, I think that uh, we're going to concentrate on this year is also in the area of enterprise cybersecurity, making sure that the whole enterprise, okay, um, is secure in an electronic sense. Yeah. Yeah, um, for Mr. Whitaker, is the FAA contemplating another strategic reorganization of the next gen office and? If so, what, if so, what role will the tech center have in the new structure? We don't anticipate any uh, significant reorganizations uh, of the office at this time. Um, uh, the next gen organization uh, reports up to me, as does the the PMO on the ATC side. So we have um, we have I have line of sight over over that um, um, all aspects of, of next gen in that regard. Um, the tech center will remain in its current status. Um, under Dennis, reporting up uh, through General Bolton to me. Okay, um, and uh, and Dennis as uh, both head of R and D and for the FAA uh, as director. Uh, what do you think the major challenges are that you see for the integration of unmanned aerial systems into the national airspace? Uh, and what do you think is going to be the most important to focus on first? The biggest challenge is going to be, I think, determining a proper starting point, an area of focus. Um, the UAS problem is very broad, very complex. I believe that we have to um, start with a solvable, manageable problem that has industry and government backing behind it and focus on that and concentrate our resources on solving that problem, getting a good entryway of UAS into the national airspace. The biggest barrier is going to be on, I think, uh, the community coming together to say, yeah, this is problem number one, and this is where we should, should focus our resources on. Everyone has different perspectives, different interests, but I believe if we can find that first problem and we can all work together to solve that first problem rather than trying to solve UAS is okay, flying from low altitudes all the way through 60,000 feet and beyond. Um, maybe concentrate in an agricultural area or some solvable, manageable problem, then we can focus our resources there, learn, and then we can expand and go into other domains. Okay. Thanks. Rick? Thanks. Uh, first for, uh, for uh, Mr. Whitaker. On the tour today, we heard about uh, the progress in ADSB installations, and you mentioned it today, saying 95% of ground stations for ADSB are installed, and then this month, at some point, it'd be 100%, and that would set a baseline. I think you used the term it would be the baseline for
for ADSP. Can you explain what you mean by that as, uh, as opposed to, okay, when does the switch turn on? So once the, um, once the installations are in, then we, the, the ADSP system needs to be integrated with the new automation systems that are going to be running in the centers, particularly the ERAM high altitude centers. So as ERAM finishes up uh, in the spring of next year, the ADSP has to be integrated into that system. So the, you know, this morning the term system of systems was used uh, on a couple of occasions. These are two systems that have to be integrated together as part of the process going forward. And you uh, mentioned, I think in your testimony, 18 of 20 of the centers have uh, ERAM running? About, about half of them run it full time with no, back, with no backup in use. The others are in extended runs, so they may do a 72 hour run, to look for bugs, go back to the old system off and on. So uh, 18 of them are in some form of running it. Uh, over half of them are running it 24 seven, and the others are still in this, um, on and off phase, and then within the next year, we'll have all 20 of them running it full time. Yeah. So a couple of weeks ago, we had a round table, and, we, and uh, the chairman had asked uh, you to outline a set of milestones by uh, May 20th, 1st or something, with regards to implementing the, uh, the Tier 1A recommendations uh, from the, from the uh, uh, NAC. Uh, can you, I know it's only been a couple of weeks, can you sketch out what you're thinking has been the last couple of weeks to get us to that May 21st date? As, as, um, as we've looked at this, the, there were two groupings of Tier 1 uh, capabilities. The first grouping deals with PBN, multiple runway operations, and surface data. Those, that grouping, and I believe there are six of them, are, were identified as, as being very important and uh, on the verge of being completed and, and should get that high priority. We, we think those are the, the right ones for our immediate attention. Um, we've had some conversations with the NAC subcommittee about that, and we believe that they agree with that. Um, with respect to the date, we have a, a NAC, a full NAC meeting in June. Uh, I'm not sure of the date, I think it's early June. Um, I think we have some concern that we ought to be validating the complete work with the NAC before it goes public. So we'll talk with your offices about the timing of whether uh, that would be an appropriate date or mid or mid May. But w we believe we can be on track certainly with the work and, and we'll continue to talk with your folks about uh, when to make that public. Yeah, great. Um, uh, let's see, for Dr. So do are you doctor? Mr. So mer merely a mister like me, huh? <laughs> Just a mister. All right. Um, well, you ought to be a doctor. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so ordered. <laughs> um, can you talk about what R&D activities this budget, the budget of $158.8 million does fund here at the Tech Center, and, uh, and do any of those dollars specifically focus on, on UAS? Okay. So I answered the second part. Um, the answer is yes. Um, about half of the dollars that are in the UAS uh, in the ballpark of around $3.7 million uh, are supporting activities that are ongoing here at the center. Um, of the R&D budget of $158 million, $62, $63 million are work that is done specifically here at the center. In, uh, a lot of the areas you saw this morning out uh, research row, as I call it, um, those activities out there uh, are supported by the R&D dollars. And how much flexibility do you have here at the center or as director of research to be flexible with those dollars to move them from one, one bucket to the next bucket if, if you need to do that? Very little authority to do that, sir. Yeah. Um, basically, I have about a 2% reserve that I maintain to be able to help programs, okay, of, of that window. But uh, uh, again, those are budget line items, and we execute them as so programmed. Right. Uh, in other words, so, so Congress says that uh, you have to spend X amount of dollars on this budget line item in research, and Y amount of dollars on that on that line item. And that's what we do, sir. Yeah. And, and we'd expect nothing less and nothing okay. more. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Um, <laughs> 
But um, <laughs> if, if someone were to ask you directly um, if you needed even a little bit more flexibility, how would you respond to that? Uh, so uh, 10 to 15 percent flexibility, sort of to be able to, to to be able to handle more tactical R&D needs. Uh, the planning for the R&D budget is uh, a three-year window out in the future. By the time we get to an execute, again, we're, we're working on a three-year-old plan. So the ability to, to adapt, just like technology today, is very quickly changing and meet those pop-up needs and changes in our environment would, uh, I think, be greatly appreciated. Um, so today on the tour, we saw an example of uh, a, a unmanned aerial system that technically qualified as a small system. Yes, sir. Uh, but because of how far it flies, it flies like a large system. Um, so how do you um, how how are you going to approach that as we're looking at the test sites and? Trying to determine, you know, how do you and, and answer this question about small, uh, small UAS and their application when it might look small but it acts big? I don't know how to answer the question, sir. Okay, um, and, and forgive me, but I mean um, that's more of a, a policy kind of, of topic. Maybe. Yeah, I think sure. Um, sure. with with UAS we we. Um, I think we're, we've got a segmented approach. We, we would like to, if you will, release as much as we can as quickly as we can. So the focus of the small UAS rule um, is to uh, move more quickly on a category of, of UAS that we think poses the, less, the, the least amount of safety risk, um, which is likely to include line of sight as one of the characteristics. Um, so uh, a model such as we viewed this morning wouldn't be categorized as small to the extent it was operated beyond line of sight. Yeah, right. You have, you have, I got a couple more. Yeah, thank you. Yield back. Um, for Mr. Whitaker, um, I understand that the FAA intends to appeal the administrative law judge's decision on small UAS oversight authority issued last Friday. Can you tell us, is the FAA also planning to conduct an expedited emergency rulemaking for small UAS? We, um, um, we, we are appealing that ruling, um, and because it's a, an active matter, I can't really comment on the substance of that, but I will say that we do view this as a serious safety issue, and um, we are looking at our options to make sure that we keep the uh, NAS safe during the, the appeal. Uh, the, the appeal will stay the, the ruling, so in that sense, it won't take effect, um, but a, an emergency rulemaking is one of the options that we are looking at. Um, and Mr. Filler, we talked about this a little bit uh, of the um, work that's being done here, but what sort of research and development, uh, if you can expand a little bit more than what you already said, is the Tech Center doing with common airborne sense and avoidance technologies? And um, are you working with the DOD on any of this research? We do work jointly um, with Department of Defense and NASA, as well as industry. Um, uh, I can't uh, at this moment recall, you know, the specific test that they're ongoing, but uh, as you can see, we do a lot of testing going on mm -hmm. here. Um, but I do know that, uh, you know, we do have routine flights uh, of our test fleet um, to ensure that, you know, newborn si or new systems are, are, in fact, safely being integrated. Uh, this last summer, I mean, we did fly the uh, ACAS-X system, um, which is, again, uh, a collision avoidance system uh, to test out new, new logic. And then this coming summer, we will, in fact, be flying variants of it that will be uh, dedicated in using logic, okay, that we expect the small UASs to uh, conform to. Um. Thanks, Dennis. Rick, do you have anything else? Yeah, uh, back to sense and avoid. I'm just curious. Uh, as, uh, last year, year and a half ago, uh, I went up with uh, one of the uh, a contractor who developed sense and avoid, and and we actually dr uh, flew ourselves towards Mount Constitution on on Orcas Island, 
uh, and got close enough to set off the, uh, the alarm system. Uh, don't advise that for anybody um, <laughs> to do that. But they wanted to show how it works. But so I'm just, and that was a, obviously a pilot in the, in the flight deck. So I am actually, I am curious about what the, what the difference between uh, a manned, uh, uh, a sense and void system on a manned system would be compared to an unmanned system, if it's a if it's something that operates automatically, given a, uh, an obstruction in the air in, in, in inside a certain envelope. So. Um the term we use here is the Mark One eyeball. Okay, he's obviously uh, the difference. Uh, I mean, a pilot has the, the responsibility for seeing a void. Um, so, barring all uh, absence of all electronic systems, we still rely on the eyeball and the visual cues. Um, they're very, very hard to, in fact, um, emulate uh, in, in electronic systems. So again, you don't have the pilot and its ability to discern. No, that is not a real target. That's not something I'm worried about. Um, in as we go into UAV operations, okay, or even as commercial GA, uh, being a a, um, a pilot at the moment, um, it's very difficult to see those aircraft out there. So not all the objects out there have uh, active transmitters necessarily on on board them yet so that we can actually see them. And so um, we've, it's not a very trivial problem to solve. Um, and it, it still requires a lot of research. Now, as ADSB is implemented on almost everything that's on an airport or that flies, then we will have active beacons that are you know, telling us where all these objects are in time and space and we'll have better situational awareness. But until uh, the ADSB rule is implemented throughout the national airspace, we still have to deal with the limitations uh, of human vision. Thanks, thank you. That's good. Uh, well, um, Mr. Whitaker, Mr. Filler, uh, thank you very much. Um, you. We'll now um, adjourn from the first panel and ask the second panel to come up, I'll take a just a little recess as long as it takes to get set up with the second panel.
started with the uh, with the second panel and uh, first like to welcome Mr. Pete Dumont, President and uh, CEO of the Air Traffic Controllers Association. Pete, thank you for being here. Thank you. Chairman Lubiondo, Ranking Member Larson, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I am speaking on behalf of the Air Traffic Control Association. ACCA was formed almost 60 years ago. We currently have more than 3,000 members from all sectors of aviation. ACCA has partnered in one way or another with the Tech Center for the last 50 years. ACCA's primary mission is to promote the science of air traffic control. As you know, NextGen is a complex, all-encompassing transformation of our current NAS. It requires technology refresh as well as procedural and policy changes. To accomplish such a large, complex project, the right management structure with the right capabilities must be in place. In recent months, the administration has appointed a new deputy administrator, who you just heard from, and the FAA selected an associate administrator for NextGen, Mr. Ed Bolton. This is certainly a step in the right direction. With this new management structure, an evaluation of current assets and alignments must certainly occur. Any strategic realignment or reorganization of the NextGen organization must surely include the Tech Center. We encourage that Mr. Bolton, in his short time at FAA, has already visited the Tech Center on five separate occasions. The last time he was here, he used a simulator to gain some intel prior to taking a familiarization flight on an Airbus in preparation for a NAC meeting. Mr. Bolton seems to understand the value of the center and the critical role that it must play in the implementation of NextGen. The Tech Center has many capabilities to move NextGen forward, as I'm sure you saw in your tour of the facility today. I've outlined a number of those capabilities in my written testimony and would be glad to answer any questions regarding that testimony. The Tech Center is currently performing NextGen work on Datacom with Harris Corporation and with Excellus on ADSB. These are but two models in which the Tech Center is partnering with industry to move NextGen forward. The models are very different. One incorporates the use of industry personnel on site at the Tech Center to work directly with the labs, and the other collects data in the field for verification and validation by and at the Tech Center. I use these two examples to show the different models available. There are many industry partners and active members performing indispensable work on NextGen for the FAA. We believe one role for the Tech Center would be as a collection facility for all of the U.S. test data from the six recently identified test sites throughout the U.S. The Tech Center could analyze and report out on the work being done at these facilities. Verification and validation, both against specification and requirements, cannot occur independently at six different sites. The lack of one central location will lead to duplication of efforts, siloed results, increased costs, and a multitude of other inefficiencies. This is only one of the ways the Tech Center can help move NextGen forward. I was pleased to hear that the FAA supports this approach. The Tech Center requires both external and internal collaboration to be successful. For all of the state-of-the-art technology, people, and processes in place, they are resource-constrained and cannot do it alone. They must collaborate and partner to accomplish the goal of next-gen implementation. This collaboration must occur both internally with different departments within the FAA and externally with industry, academia, users, associations, and other government agencies. Internally, the government must partner with managers program managers of individual pieces of the next-gen solution, as well as operators through the union and facility management. These are the experts on requirements. Externally, the FAA must continue to collaborate with industry to not only integrate new equipment and technologies, but new regulations and procedures. Industry has the expertise to augment the skills and talents within the FAA at the Tech Center and to fill in the holes where the expertise is lacking. Industry already brings lessons learned to the table from large-scale integration and transformation programs in other industries as well as within the FAA. The Tech Center must also continue to partner with academia as they have with the 14 universities taking part in a new 10-year research effort into alternative aviation fuels, another area of next gen. And the Tech Center must continue to partner with associations like ATCA to ensure an open and frank discussion of solutions planned and in progress with the entire aviation community. This will enable the industry experts, users, and other association groups to understand exactly what the FAA needs in terms of resources, research, expertise, and funding. Every significant air traffic control challenge the avian, aviation industry has faced in the last 58 years has been discussed and debated at an ATCA symposium. The Tech Center must itself be a next-gen facility, fully scalable both up and down. As the demands for support increase, the center must be able to expand to handle the workload. And as the workload decreases, the opposite must occur. This will require additional support from contractors for personnel as well as FAA employees. NextGen must move forward, and the Tech Center plays a vital role in its development and implementation. I would be glad to answer any questions you may have regarding this opening statement or my testimony. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Pete. Um, now we'll turn to our next witness, Ms. Th Cynthia Castillo, President and CEO of CSSI Incorporated. <laughs> 
uh, you're recognized. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, first, I wanted to thank Congressman Lobiondo and members of the subcommittee uh, for the opportunity to speak here today and I'm specifically very proud to represent industry. CSSI works with government and commercial clients to ensure transportation systems are designed and equipped to safely and efficiently move people and materials. We leverage our deep roots in aviation to pioneer innovative analytics and best practices that maximize system capacity, decrease costs, and improve safety. CSSI has participated firsthand in the evolution of the aviation industry over the last two decades. We've driven over 140 operational improvements as direct results of corrective actions taken based on our voluntary safety reporting programs. We've maximized the prospects of safety aviation travels with newer, stronger safety standards, and we've helped thousands of aircraft meet RVSM certification requirements, therefore maximizing airspace capacity, reducing fuel burn, and saving millions of dollars in fuel costs. In addition, we drive research, test, and evaluation efforts to identify how unmanned aircraft systems can safely be integrated into the NAS. And we've supported next-gen initiatives that cut flight miles and increase fuel savings. The Tech Center is one of our key partners. Most of the work we do at the Tech Center directly contributes to the aviation modernization efforts and drives results in three key areas, improving aviation safety, the safe integration of the UASs into the NAS, and next gen. Safety, as you know, Mr. Chairman, is the, industry, the aviation industry's top priority, and improvement initiatives are prevalent throughout all aviation modernization efforts. CSSI has fostered the development of safety management systems that enforce newer and stronger standards for managing safety risk and accountability and minimizing the risk of safety incidents occurring. We also drive the development of non-punitive safety reporting programs and industry-wide industry -wide, uh, information sharing programs. A cornerstone of our aviation safety work at the Tech Center is the development and implementation of global and regional separation and performance-based standards. As part of our role, we work with the international regulators and participate in every step of the international standardization process. Our work in separation standards includes the successful implementation of reduced separation standards for specific types of aircraft in the New York Oceanic Flight Information Region. In addition, as part of the North Atlantic Data Link Mandate, we've increased the percentage of flights that use future air navigation systems and text message-like communications between pilots and controllers, resulting in enhanced operational safety in the North Atlantic. Introducing UASs into the, national, into the nation's airspace is challenging for both the FAA and the aviation community. CSSI works with the Tech Center to bring a real-world perspective to modeling and simulation, simulation scenarios that emulate this complex air traffic control environment. The lessons learned can be relied upon to accurately characterize the workloads expected in a next-gen artsy environment. Maximizing the safe and efficient use of airspace in airports is critical to accommodate future aviation demand. The aviation industry is working hard to meet the challenge of FAA forecasts that predict 1 billion passengers by 2015. To meet this challenge, CSSI works closely with the Tech Center in support of next-gen concepts such as testing and implementing pilot projects under the Runway Incursion Reduction Program, and optimizing airspace and procedures in the Metroplex in eight of the 21 regions, with 10 more planned. The FAA is working tirelessly to modernize what is already the safest and most progressive aviation system in the world. And at CSSI, we're proud of how we've partnered with the Tech Center to integrate new technologies into the NAS, all of which will enhance safety save fuel, reduce delays, and increase capacity. Government and industry must continue to collaborate closely to achieve next-gen milestones in the face of tight deadlines and budget challenges. It is imperative for the future of air, net, of air transportation and for our nation's economy. Mr. Chairman, 
This is why it's so important for the FAA and the Technical Center to receive the support they need to stay at the leading edge of aviation technology and to contribute to set the gold standard for the rest of the world. The traveling public deserves nothing less. This concludes my testimony. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, our next witness is uh, Mr. Melvin Davis, National Representative for NextGen National Air Traffic Controllers Association. Thank you for being here. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, thank, or Chairman Lobiondo and Ranking Member Larson, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. NACA is honored to have this opportunity to address the committee on this fine afternoon in New Jersey. NECA takes seriously its rep responsibility to represent the 20,000 bargaining unit members around the country, some of who are stationed here at the William J. Hughes Technical Center. We embrace the Technical Center's role in the research, development, testing, integration, sustainment, and modernization of the components of the national airspace system. The aviation industry has collectively recognized that the transition to a next generation air transportation system will not happen all at once. The progress will be methodical and it'll be iterative. It will require new systems and capabilities to, to be deployed alongside legacy systems. <laughs> the Technical Center is essentially a miniaturized version of a complete legacy national airspace system in one location with ATOP, Micro EARTS, ARTS, TAMR, ERAM, TFMS, TBFM, SWIM, and the voice switches all located in one place and maintained to the same readiness level as those systems deployed across the nation, the Tech Center truly represents a one-stop shopping opportunity to test and initially deploy the next generation systems in conjunction with our now gen systems. This physical capability combined with the technical experts from many of the different aviation domains working here, enabled by a relevant federal acquisition and operational policies, represent a truly unique national asset. The Technical Center is the location where many of our current air traffic controllers come to interact with both the FAA technical staff and the civilian team members from the various vendors contracted by the government to produce the systems currently deployed across the NAS. These interactions within the FAA firewall with equivalent systems to those which they operate daily back home are invaluable to the current sustainment and future progress of the NAS. This value is directly measurable in three ways. First, by increased efficiency from current systems. An example of this is second level support that extends the lifespan and expands on latent capabilities of current systems. So, as we deploy next gen systems alongside the legacy equipment, the second level maintainers here in New Jersey assist with resolving the inevitable interactivity issues that cross up or that crop up. Second, by reducing problem reports with systems during the deployment phase. For example, operational tests and evaluation combined with verification and validation expedite resolution of problem reports. The problem reports are a tracking mechanism used by controllers and maintainers to resolve issues associated with the deployment of new systems such as ADS-B or time-based flow management. The third way that we can measure these uh, enhancements is by reducing the risk of fielding new systems. An example of this is the human factors community. Work done by the human factors researchers to detect and resolve conflicts between humans and machines referred to as human machine interface or computer human interface. This work is essential to ensuring that the capabilities like data communications will function as intended once deployed. Another significant capability resident here at the William J. Hughes Technical Center is the scientific community that supports the wake turbulence programs. The scientific evaluation of wake turbulence, which is very in-depth and very specific, um, has, and the, and has produced relatively simple solutions derived from that body of work, which it was conducted mainly here at the Technical Center and has recently been deployed within the NAS. The result of these deployments have had dramatic effects, creating significant capacity enhancements, and both, uh, both safely and efficiently. I would like to uh, close with my, my verbal testimony by stating that all of these things that I have described are the result of a harmonious relationship between government, labor, scientists, technicians, and private vendors made possible by the common understanding that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts.
On behalf of NACA, I would like to thank you again for the opportunity, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Melvin. Uh, <coughs> next, and our final witness is this Mr. Ben Gilo, the General Counsel and Senior Government um, Relations Manager for the Association of Unmanned Vehicles. Ben, thank you for being here. Chairman Lobiondo, Ranking Member Larson, uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. It, it really is a, a, a true honor for me as a few years ago I was staffing Congressman, then Congressman Vern Ehlers on this committee, uh, which, which happened to be his favorite uh, committee, so it, it, it's a real pleasure to be here. Today I'm speaking on behalf of the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International, AUVSI. We're the world's largest um, nonprofit organization devoted to the advancement of unmanned systems. As you know, unmanned aircraft systems, or UAS, increase human potential, allowing us to execute dangerous or difficult tasks safely and efficiently. This technology also has the potential to create tens of thousands of jobs and tens of billions of dollars in economic impact. Because of cost and rapidly advancing capabilities, small UAS, such as this two-pound quadcopter uh, that I brought for show and tell, um, get, will comprise a majority of the developing uh, commercial market. Most of these operations will be conducted below 500 feet uh, with limited need to fly above 1,500 feet. However, the current pace of UAS integration specifically for small UAS is simply unacceptable. The FAA has been working on a rule for small UAS since 2009, which should have been finalized in 2011. Unfortunately, the FAA does not plan on releasing this rule now until the fall, which means it likely won't be finalized until sometime in at least 2015. The longer the FAA takes to write these regulations, the greater the risk to aviation safety because people are already flying these systems. A simple uh, YouTube or, or Google search um, will, will be evident of that. So the need, and, and the need for this rule became even more evident uh, last Thursday when a judge with the NTSB ruled that the FAA has no authority to regulate model aircraft or unmanned aircraft systems because they have not gone through formal rulemaking. As was stated earlier, the FAA has already appealed this decision um, and uh, it, will, it, it may in fact um, issue an emergency rule that's all yet to be determined. We hope that if an emergency rule is issued, it will not be overly restrictive on small UAS. Regarding work at the Tech Center, the, the FAA has long complained that it needs data to safely integrate unmanned aircraft systems, and the Tech Center is the logical place to do that data work. However, the UAS Research Department at the Tech Center is understaffed, it is under-resourced, um, and its current research is not based on a strategic plan to integrate unmanned aircraft system into the NAS. Although the FAA's UAS research budget has grown in recent years from approximately $4 million in 2013 to $8 million in 2014 and possibly $9 million in 2015, um, there is currently less than five full-time UAS researchers here at the Tech Center. The rest of the researchers are either contractors or on loan from other departments. We would like to see this core team expanded. Currently, all UAS research at the Tech Center is funded through the FAA's research and engineering and development budget, which provides very little flexibility on how funds can be used. And I think that was addressed a little bit earlier. In this research budget, all FAA research programs have to compete against one another, and it's the FAA's technical community representative groups that makes the final decisions on what projects do in fact get funded. In 2014, six UAS projects were approved by the TCRG with a total budget of approximately $8 million. Interestingly, none of them were for UAS test site data management. However, now that the sites have been selected, the FAA is in need of a location to store and analyze the data as well as resources to do that data analysis. Because no new money is available in the research budget and because of inflexibility, the FAA was forced to cancel one of its existing projects and use about half of that amount, roughly half a million dollars, to initiate the test site data work. In our opinion, if the FAA is committed to using the test sites to collect and analyze data, a half million dollars is, is going to be inadequate. Furthermore, according to the FAA, because they were not given money to start up or manage the test sites, the FAA is unable to direct any research work at these test sites. So this begs the question, what type of data will the test sites collect? Will everyone be speaking the same data language? Where will the data go? We assume here at the Tech Center. How will proprietary information be protected? How will the data be used? How will duplicative work be avoided? The FAA hopes to iron out these details when it brings the six sites together here at the Tech Center later this month. Lastly, I, we would like to request that the committee closely monitor the FAA's compliance with a provision in the 2014 Defense Bill 
that requires a report to Congress this summer on the resource requirements needed to implement the UAS roadmap. Understanding how much it will cost to integrate unmanned aircraft into the national airspace will help us understand the size and the scope of this problem. If, for whatever reason, the FAA can't meet that deadline, we suggest the GAO possibly be tasked with it. UAS offer great promise, but before this industry can take off, we need the safety rules. And it's in all of our best interest to help the FAA get the data it needs to write the safety regulations. The tech center, along with industry, government, and others are willing to do that work. So again, thank you for this opportunity. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, well, thank you. Just for clarification, what you have in front of you is not a model, it's, it's actually a working size? So the only thing that differentiates a model aircraft when an unmanned aircraft is the intent of flight. So you could buy this system yourself, uh, Mr. Chairman, and fly it, and as long as you're doing it for recreation or for fun, if you have a smile on your face, you'd be considered a modeler. You would not have to comply with FAA regulations. But what you have in front of you actually can fly. Yeah, yes, they, they, this is an actual system. They did not give me the ground control station, so I can't fly it, but okay. it does have a, a system underneath here. If you were to use Use those pictures and sell those pictures, the FAA would deem that a commercial activity and that would be prohibited. Prohibited. Okay. Thank you. Um, first question uh, is sort of a multi-part question for anyone on the panel who would like to uh, take a shot at it. What do you see are the major challenges uh, to integration of UAS into the national airspace? Uh, what area do you think is going to be the most important to focus on first? And based on your knowledge of the Tech Center, how can the resources and expertise of the Tech Center be leveraged to help meet the challenge? Who wants to take a first shot at that? I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in and, and, and take this hook uh, first. So uh, the, the challenges for, for integration, uh, there, there are a lot of them. I mean, this is a huge challenge. And as was talked about in the first panel, you know, systems like this that weigh two pounds all the way up to the systems that weigh 30,000 pounds, this should not be a one-size-fits-all um, kind of a, a, a solution that is needed. And, and I think to emphasize what Director Filler said, uh, if we focus on things that we could do now, for instance, small UAS operations over uh, farms or some kind of activity where there's a minimal safety risk, to get some sort of commercial activities now will alleviate a lot of the built-up pressure faced by the industry today, which is currently prohibited from flying at all. So I, I think that if, if we bite off a little bit, that would help. As far as the work that the tech center can do, they are doing good work. They're doing a lot of sense and avoid work, some command and control stuff. But the tech center has never done research work in small unmanned aircraft. All of their system, all of their work has been focused on the big stuff flying in class A airspace. The reality is the commercial market is in small UAS. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, um, as an air traffic controller, obviously that the, it, it, it goes without saying clearly where, where um, our hearts are in the matter. Uh, and, and, and there are some inferences automatically when you start talking about unmanned systems or autonomous systems that there's an uh, in, in inherent lack of, con of my ability to control what it does via an interaction with a pilot. So there's clear concerns there, but those again are just mm -hmm. kind of built in. Um, we'll need to work through those, and we'll need to work through with the, uh, with the UAS community on those. But um, what I would say as far as major challenges in general, as far as uh, integrating UAS into NASA's, is kind of taps, taps back to that air traffic control aspect. Is, is there going to be a pilot that's operating it, or is it just an operator? And so one of the things that, that um, happens in a system, in this system today, is there's humans that, are, that have procedures and training. And we generally, when things go well, we're following the procedures and training to the T. And, and when things go bad, there are fallback procedures and there's fallback training. And so I think when you start to get down a little bit lower into the um, operator category, if we're not ensuring that those um, procedures and training are, are there or, or built in or regulated, um, we're, we could see some, some challenges there. So that goes back to the first part of your question, what's a major challenge? Um, another one is um, um, what the role of the tech center will be and what role it could play. I think that the tech center is is uniquely situated um, to greatly assist the effort to integrate UAS and NAS for two reasons. One is because of all of the resident um, systems that are already here that represent what's operating already in the NAS. In addition to that, there's um, there has been some wisdom applied to it to bring in UAS capabilities into the NIAC lab. That was an investment by the federal government to deploy a lab here that had next-gen systems in it and then also put UAS systems into it. So I think we have a, a neat opportunity there on the NIAC lab 
the second piece of that, though, is the uh, Ben, uh, Mr. Gilo mentioned the proprietary data, the ability of the federal government to bring in multiple vendors to share information and have it firewalled or protected, and then we could um, evaluate that information and make uh, decisions without um, a, a vendor necessarily losing a competitive advantage. Anybody else? Yes, Mr. Chairman, integrating U.S. into the um, national airspace system is probably the most difficult um, task we've ever attempted uh, since the beginning of flight. Um, normally, it's been faster and larger aircraft, which have their own uh, issues integrating into the NAS. Uh, the problem with UAS as an integration is there's so many different kinds with so many capabilities and so many different missions. Um, you spoke of sense and avoid and mm -hmm. how you're in a piloted aircraft. Well, piloted aircraft and a global hawk, or which is an unpiloted aircraft, uh, have a large payload capability and they can have the equipment on board for sense and avoid. Putting sense and avoid on this particular UAS right here would be much more difficult. Um, how the tech center can help us with those types of issues is um, to partner with industry, bring industry in uh, to find out what their needs are, what their capabilities are, what type of vehicles they actually want to fly in the airspace, and develop a concept of operations, which many industry partners have done on many different uh, types of projects. So they could be very helpful in that. And then use the NIAC, like Mel was referring to, to model, simulate, um, the flying of these different types of UASs in different types of airspace to see what the results would be so that we can uh, integrate them successfully into the airspace. I'd like to just expand on some of the challenges that were already addressed, uh, specifically with the standards and, and procedures of operating in the NAS. Uh, in, in integrating UASs, um, I believe some of the work that the Technical Center does today, specifically with modeling and simulation, realistic, uh, scenarios of how in, uh, UASs integrate into NAS or operate in the NAS. Uh, continuation with the, the work that they do provide here, house here, is a lot of the modeling and simulation, and CSSI has been very intimate with that. Yeah, Mr. Da Mr. Davis, um, has the FAA or have, has NATCA contemplated, contemplated new training or procedures for air traffic controllers as UAS is integrated into the, into the national airspace? Uh, yes, Ranking Member uh, Larson. The, the, the good news is, and I should, have, um, I should have stated it foremost in my initial response to Chairman Lobiondo's question, is the good news is there's an incredible amount of UAS operations occurring daily in the NAS with multiple partners and with tons of, of um, aircraft, actual piloted aircraft interactions and, and controllers involved. And somehow or another, in, in spite of all of the delay and bureaucracy that goes on, there's, there's um, a lot of learning that's, that's going along with that. And so I can say, if we look back, say, two, three, five years or so, are we smarter now than we were then? Yes. Are we capturing those lessons and applying them and, and starting to lay down some of the basics? And the answer is yes. And so could we be doing it better and more methodically and, and, and um, in addition to all the other work that's going on? Yeah, absolutely. Could there be progress? Could there be, um, could, it, you know, could we be um, expanding it and doing it better? We could. But the good news is, is that, yes, there are already, through that, again, through that, that concept of partnership, we're, um, I'll just take for just a moment and expand on a scenario that's that's been de deployed across the NASA over the last couple of years. It's called a just culture, and it was a it was a, an effort by the federal government to actually trust um, the employees, both on the airline side and the controller side, to say, "Tell us what's going on," so that we don't have to look back at an accident, which is a risk-based view. We can look forward at at problems via um, a predictive mode, and so we have employees that fill out extensive reports about something that didn't result in an accident, but it was an incident and it would not have borne the full, um, full investigative arm, but it, it encourages people to tell the truth or to tell, to tell deeply and specifically what happened so that we can put it into a database and then later mine that database to find um, hot spots or where things might occur. And um, it's a classic example of, again, wisdom and forward thinking and trust. And we're, we're able to mine those databases for both training and for predictive safety measures and those types of things. And so that'll bear immense fruit as we move forward. And that program is called Aviation Safety, blah, 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 Asias. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. It stands for awesome. Uh, yeah, certainly uh, 
Frank and I both know this, and some folks, this might be your first hearing if you've ever participated in even watching. There's just a lot of abbreviations and acronyms, and, yes. thank and you. Uh, we get a little we get a little too used to it. We apologize. You're very gracious. That, thank so. you. Um, but uh, Mr. Dumont, um, uh, with regard to the symposium that the symposium that ATCA has, have you developed a one, have you developed a consensus on UAS? And second, have you developed a consensus on what the next big question is for ATCA to address? And what's the next? Have we developed a consensus? A consensus no, solution on how to approach things. I mean, you have these symposia. I know it's. I know they're in Atlantic City, and I know it's not just for fun. Um, you, do, you say you struggle with the questions. You have your input. Do you come up with consensus recommendations as an industry through these symposia on what to do about uh, on, uh, what to do about any of the big questions that we're facing. Oh, we, we do, yes. Yeah. I thought you were talking about just uh, U.S. And no, it's not just for fun. Uh, <laughs> we do a lot of work at ACA. As a matter of fact, one of the uh, comments I get at our three-day here in Atlantic yeah. City with technical yeah. uh, with the tech center is you get six months of business done in three days. Uh, we've come to consensus on a lot of different issues. Um, what we normally do, the tech, when we come here with the yeah. tech center, it's a technical exchange for, of information. Uh, my members the majority of them, want to know what's going on here at the Tech Center. And as they get briefed up and they understand all the programs that are in place here, um, they walk away with ways that they can help the Tech Center and they come back and work with the Tech Center to help them advance their mission. Have you, have you, uh, do, what's, what's the next big question for us then? We're dealing with UAS, working through next gen. UAS is a big question. Do you, have you, do you know what the next big one is? I don't know what the next yeah. big one is. I mean, as far as UAS is concerned, concept of operations. It, yeah. that's, that's a very important thing, and we need to get that straight. Yeah. Good. On data sharing, um, have you all, uh, as a uh, industry association group, mm -hmm. come to conclusions on, on data sharing? One question we hear from uh, uh, in the discussion about UAS and getting the data from test sites is a proprietary nature of some of the data. Right. Uh, have you all come to, a, a, as an association group, to some, come to some conclusion about how uh, te the tech center or FAA should address that proprietary data? Well, no, because th there really is no solution yet on, on uh, we haven't been told how the data collection is going to occur. Uh, is it going to be at individual sites? Is it going to be shared and collected here at the tech center? Which we think is the right um, model. I think. I think Ben, you have some information on data sharing. I, Go ahead, Ben. If, if I may, um, I, right now I don't think there's a data plan for the for the U.S. test sites. I mean, when they bring all six together here at the tech center, I think they're going to hash it out. But again, because the FAA doesn't have any funding for this, the FAA can't really tell the sites what data, what testing to do. So hopefully, everyone will come to an agreement on on the dips, on the bits that they need to collect, and they can all speak that same data language, which I am terrible at. So <laughs> and, uh, I hope I don't have to get too, too much deeper. No, All right. Sorry. Mr. Davis, sorry. Mr. Davis. I, I, I have one um, point that I believe is relevant to the data sharing um, question and, and, and something that I've just um, experienced within the last four or five months through the next gen, the broader next gen effort. And it kind of goes back to a statement that I made earlier about trust and about the, the, the SIAS program is, is a trust-based program and it's a partnership uh, between the federal government and the um, operators within the NAS. At the Next Gen Advisory Committee level, there's been an, um, on a, uh, a renaissance, if you will, on the, on the thought of data sharing on behalf of the airlines. There are fuel data sharing and operational data sharing to go back and prove the benefits of Next Gen. And I firmly believe that it's because of the trust that's been built at the Next Gen Advisory Committee, those relationships between government and, and vendors that sit in a room together once every three months and work out the details and say, you know what, as an aviation community, we have to work together to improve the community. Whereas I think before, prior to that trust being built, there was this standoffish attitude that says, I'm gonna protect my data and, and it, even if it's to my detriment. And so I see that renaissance there and I think there's an opportunity to potentially establish relationships with the UAS operators and leverage that trust. Okay. And finally, uh, Ms. Castillo, could you pick one of the projects that your company's worked on and be more specific about the role that you all uh, played sure. in supporting the tech center? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I'll, I'll stick with separation standards. Um, I, I know a lot of the conversation today is centered around uh, UASs and, and in my belief the safe separation standards will always be a priority of the FAA. 
Uh, we've worked closely with our uh, technical center uh, partners and uh, specifically with um, global and regional uh, separation standards uh, components. And, and through our work, we've helped uh, uh, thousands of aircraft achieve uh, RVSM requirements. So we've helped uh, through really all aspects of reduced vertical separations minima, uh, RVSM uh, requirements from development and implementation to uh, the assisting the FA, assisting with approval of flying uh, in that airspace. And um, I'm, I'm really proud of the work that we've done with our partners here uh, in separation. So, so what does that work entail? So a lot of the, the work as um, uh, it, it, the safe separation of aircraft, which uh, when you're introducing other obstacles or other uh, demand for users in the aviation, uh, we have to always look at how those things are safely uh, integrated in addition to how aircraft and, and uh, things integrated in the NAS are safely separated. So to me, it's all about uh, increasing, uh, maximizing the capacity of airspace. Uh, so we look at some uh, models uh, and concepts of, of ops on uh, airspace redesign, um, and it specifically touches a lot of the performance-based navigation. So to me, it's about maximizing capacity of airspace, uh, thereby reducing fuel uh, costs and fuel burn and emissions, if you will, and uh, saving a lot of dollars for uh, the flying public. Okay. Uh, this is uh, also a question for any one of the panel. Uh, what role will partnerships between FAA, industry, labor, and academia play in the future of NextGen? And what role do you see the Tech Center playing in developing and utilizing these partnerships? Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, I um, appreciated the, the first panel talking about the partnerships because collaboration is going to be key um, to our continued understanding of, of how certain uh, impacts to the NAS will, will occur. And uh, CSSI, been, my company has been partnered with the FAA for over 23 years, but specifically with the FAA Technical Center for about 20 years. And um, we feel that uh, CSSI and companies like CSSI augment and complement a lot of this, the talent, the technical talent here at the Tech Center uh, in skill sets as well as capabilities uh, to, uh, if you will, show up in a broader, deeper way uh, as a team, uh, taking on the challenges or the initiatives that are uh, at hand. Uh, and uh, in and I think recently in some of the challenging times of, of budget uh, constraints, uh, companies, contractors, industry can uh, provide the skill sets, specialized skill sets uh, to um, perform duties, whether they're long or short term. So we have readily available resources to come in and work a task, whether it be three months, uh, or so. So I think augmenting and complementing the skill sets here, the partnerships with, with universities certainly is uh, an avenue for recruitment and the future uh, operators of, uh, and leadership, if you will, for uh, of what will be running and operating uh, the, the FAA and all of the challenges that we're dealing with today. Um, Pete, please. Oh. Okay. Um, there are multiple partnerships, internal and external partnerships that have to occur. Internal partnerships with the, the users, the operators, uh, the program managers, as I mentioned in my opening statement. That's to define the requirements and make sure we get them right. And then we need to partner with industry to bring some of the solutions to the table that we might not have thought of within the industry. They fill the holes that we don't have expertise-wise, and um, they bring experience to the table from uh, multiple programs in different industries that we can learn from that we might not have thought of. Uh, that helps us to address the requirements and produce outcomes that are measurable uh, so that we can measure our success in the end. So um, one of the things that um, I've been blessed with uh, is the opportunity to work uh, in, a, in the federal government in a time of, of, of no partnership, in a time of a very deep and strong partnership. <laughs> and uh, 
it, it, uh, I can tell you, uh, based on the, the deep relationships that I had before we went into those, those times and, and the time and those, made, those relationships that we were able to maintain and, and then enhance afterwards, it is um, a very passionate uh, point of mine that I'd like to make that the value of partnering with the human capital, ensuring that there's clear and open communication on the human side, especially as we move into these complex, like they described today, complex systems of systems. There are interactions that will occur that no one will be able to understand, and you will not be able to map back and clearly explain exactly what went wrong. But with the value of those strong partnerships of being able to have honest and open dialogue, to be able to at least bracket certain parts of of, or corners of what happened and say, okay, we don't want to go there again because of those complexities, but to be able to understand as much as we can about them um, will prove invaluable as we, as we continue to deploy systems that overlay each other and interact with each other. I, I'd just like to add that the, uh, the, the, the test sites themselves would like to see the tech center more involved. Um, our members would like to see the, the, the tech center more involved. In fact, I think some of our members um, had actually either loaned unmanned aircraft to the tech center or simulators for the tech center to use in, in some of their UAS work because this is obviously very new to them. And I think that, that our members are, are interested in continuing that relationship. Um, Mr. Dumont, this one is for you. Um, we think one of the biggest challenges currently facing us in the short term uh, for next-gen imp implementation is rewriting the controller handbook to allow the use of next-gen procedures in a mixed equipage environment. Um, do you think that uh, the tech center can use tools like the NIAC to help facilitate that or any other suggestions to help facilitate that? Okay. Um, all right, I think those are two separate questions, actually. Okay. So I, I think we absolutely need to use the NIAC uh, as we've talked about briefly, uh, the NIAC is very important in its role as being able to simulate the current environment, introduce new technologies, see how those new technologies work um, in different simulated scenarios, whether it be a busy time frame or not busy time frame. What works at JFK might not work in Seattle. Um, so that's important. But the role of the NIAC would be to develop a solution um, that can be implemented in the airspace. And then once that solution has been developed, you'll need to rewrite the handbook so that the controllers are aware of what the procedures, rules, and regulations are to be able to use that new uh, technology and implementation. Yeah, and I think, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, on the, on the actual, on the specific um, controller handbook, 7110.65 question, that's um, one of my handbook. Um, um, I, that, I would tell you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, w I would say that, that there was um, the previous chief operating officer at FAA, uh, David Grizzle, identified very accurately a lag in the deployment of, of technology and the waiver of the use of that technology and then the institutionalization of that within the 7110.65. And so there was a, a, a work group that started that was hyper effective at, at lasering in and getting those changes into the .65 and able to make up that lag in a very short period of time. It would be unfortunate to see that, um, that lag come back. Um, as far as the NIAC is concerned, specifically, we could use, we could front load that process, right, and, and predict what we need to change in the point sixty five through some of the use of, of the, the capabilities built into the NIAC. And I think it goes back to your original um, question, Ranking Member Larson, to uh, Mr. Filler about having some flexibility within his budget to be able to say, listen, I know I'm going to need to do something at that NIAC within the next three years. I'm not sure what. So give me some room to maneuver in the, in the meantime, and we can use that. Um, that flexibility to make sure we're ready when the time comes. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Um, well, I want to uh, thank our panelists, both panels, very much. Um, this is obviously a very important issue. I'd like to uh, to thank our host, the FAA, uh, and once again, to most importantly, um, thank the men and women of the Tech Center who, on a day in and day out basis, have a commitment to excellence and uh, are producing uh, such great work here. So with that, the committee stands adjourned.